Hello and welcome to A Call to Arms, a series of interviews discussing a range of issues relevant to defence with UK practitioners at the top of their profession. I'm Andy Young and I work for the Military Sciences Research Group here at the Royal United Services Institute on Whitehall. Each month, I will host an interview with a senior leader from within the UK Armed Forces, exploring the issues that face defence today and tomorrow, giving you the inside story on how the military orientates itself to face future challenges. This series is kindly supported by Airbus, a company that employs 12,500 people around the UK and contributes £7 billion to UK GDP. This month on A Call to Arms, uh, I talked to Dr Peter Homer, CBE, Director General Defence Medical Services. Peter has nearly 40 years management experience, 20, including 27 as Chief Executive of three university teaching hospitals and two national organisations, including the Commission for Health Improvement. He assumed his current post in August 2019 as the Defence Authority for End-to-End Defence Healthcare and Medical Operational Capability. Peter, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Medical services are one of those defence enablers that are seldom discussed and yet, as the pandemic has shown, are absolutely vital, not just for the armed forces, but wider societal resilience. So I think this is a very timely uh, discussion. Um, Before we dive into the detail, would it be possible for you to give us an overview of DMS and where it stands today? Yes, of course. And I'm really pleased to to join you and, uh, and others um, Defence Medical Services, as you rightly say, and is a bit like oxygen. It's often taken for granted that we miss its absence. And I'm delighted to say that uh, Defence Medical Services has proudly stood uh, shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters in the NHS and across um, wider society to do our very best to uh, fight the COVID fight. But in terms of the Defence Medical Services, uh, we are responsible for the provision um, of occupational health and patient care to all uh, serving personnel, and in many cases, their families as well around the globe. Um, And um, we uh, have a budget in the order of circa uh, half a billion pounds. Um, We're um, the largest um, component of um, strategic command, the command um, uh, to which um, I report, Um, and obviously have very strong working relationships across the three single services, and uh, MOD, and indeed wider government. Um, We um, have um, a major programme of change uh, simultaneously with business as usual. And and I would assess, um, knowing the world of healthcare change uh, reasonably well, that um, our um, um, intent and endeavour within defence medical services in terms of improving what we do, how we do it, and where we do it, is amongst the most ambitious and challenging um, in uh, modern healthcare anywhere in the world. Thank you for that. I mean, it's really interesting when you talk about developing and delivering change whilst going through the, the, the continuity of delivery um, in very straightened and heightened circumstances that we currently find ourselves in. Um, now, I understand that you are the first non uniformed and non military Director General of Defence Medical Services. Um, what do you? What opportunities do you see for DMS to learn from the NHS, and for the NHS to learn from DMS as you go through all these changes and transformations? Mm, Andy, thank you. And it's really important. I emphasise um, what a huge privilege it is for me to serve um, our Defence Medical Services and those who serve our nation. Uh, and I, I've always had um, great admiration. Uh, for those within the MOD when I worked in the NHS and uh, on a number of occasions we worked particularly closely uh, uh, with um, uh, MOD colleagues Um, and um, I've learned a great deal uh, and I hope I've contributed a great deal as well um, albeit uh, uh, in uh, in a modest capacity Um, but the 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 question you ask about learning is um, is is bilateral um, there are things, respectfully, that uh, I think those of us within the MOD can learn with the NHS and vice versa. And some of the, the areas um, when I was reflecting on, uh, on, 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 on capabilities that perhaps uh, are more maturely developed within the NHS compared to at MOD include the, uh, the following. Uh, firstly, um, the um, understanding and development of um, the application of improvement science. 
Uh, and uh, this goes back to Deming, and there are many more uh, contemporary exponents, um, but particularly in healthcare, uh, where the, the disciplined application of um, a range of tools and techniques um, to improve what we do uh, is, um, uh, is more formalized in a structured way in the NHS than in the, in the MOD. And that's not in any way to say the MOD is anything other than forward leaning, very agile and very effective in terms of improving, improving services. And indeed, uh, um, we know that from major conflicts, uh, life-saving treatments uh, and life-enhancing treatments uh, have been um, uh, shared from the battlefield into the NHS. And I used to work in a major trauma center, so I know full well the enormous benefits that. But the application of, imp of improvement science, um, which um, uh, uh, is, uh, is one of the methods of ensuring continuous quality improvement, uh, where um, staff, clinicians and non-clinicians are trained um, to apply these improvement tools and techniques is, uh, is, is rather more developed within the, the NHS than the MOD. Um, and uh, indeed, there's some really great work going on STRATCOM with input from uh, Defence Medical Services and other parts of STRATCOM to strengthen that capability. That would be one. Uh, the other is devolution of financial responsibility and accountability. Uh, in the NHS, uh, that's uh, the, the, the model um, is that those closest to um, um, the front line also have financial responsibility with, within agreed limits, of course. Um, I, I observe within the MOD, we don't do that so much. Um, and that can lead to delay, some frustration. And when we overlay onto that, um, the, uh, the acquisition process and arrangements, th those two can combine to, um, uh, to create uh, uh, some delay in, in, in being able to acquire the sort of capabilities, equipment sometimes that one would want. And, and again, that's not to say there isn't really great work going on. There is. Um, including within defence medical services with our friends from um, our commercial uh, team and DNS. Um, but there's probably more we can do in that, um, uh, that space. And the other aspect I would say is the relationship with suppliers. I think in the NHS, uh, that, uh, respecting the, uh, the proper disciplines to make sure that there's the right separation and the avoidance of conflicts of interest. But I think the, the NHS... Uh, is a little more at ease in engaging with suppliers than, than is typically the case as far as MOD colleagues are concerned. And I understand why that is, because the procurements um, in the MOD are often billions of pounds, um, whereas in the NHS they're rarely of that, uh, that order. Um, but the, the opportunity to learn what different suppliers can offer uh, is one way of helping us to improve services. And so that would be, uh, that would be another dimension. Um, and equally, there are, there are lessons the other way around that um, um, the MOD, uh, I'm absolutely clear, can, uh, can offer the NHS. And that's why I'm a very strong supporter of, 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 of us within Defence Medical Services, welcoming colleagues from the NHS to spend some time with us on secondment. I mean, obviously, we have very many clinicians doing, um, doing precisely that and vice versa, that some of our people would spend time in the NHS to, uh, to broaden their experience. It's really interesting what you, what you brought out there about continuous improvement about having the right structures in place including the, the, the right financial li I say limitations but actually liberties which obviously in a very hierarchical very ordered um, organization like the MOD where you, you are seeking approval from above um, can be quite quite restricted um, and I think from what you've said it, it really comes down to how do you how do you remove some of those barriers in order to enable transformation? Is that what you're finding at the moment? That it's it's just bringing that different perspective in, and therefore lifting these these barriers from individuals from getting on on with the job. Well, I think I think it's a, it's a as your question implies, Andy. It's um, it's a a um, an amalgam of um, of approaches. Um, and they, they include uh, making sure that we listen to the voice of those who are delivering services and receiving services. In other words, listen to the customer, as well as the clinician in our case and, and others. Um, and uh, what, what I've learned mostly through my mistakes is a great question when starting on an improvement project um, is um, to ask if this service didn't exist, how would we create it? And what we find when we do a process map uh, of um, a particular service 
is that very often what we do is a product of history, accretion, tradition, convention, as opposed to actually what is absolutely required. And a really good test, which um, 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 I've seen used with very good effect, um, is to divide the um, um, elapsed time uh, with the value time, um, i.e. how long does it take us to deliver a particular activity? And what we're seeking to do is to get unity, to get one, i.e. one unit of time of elapsed time over one unit of value added activity. Um, uh, very often, uh, the elapsed time is hundreds of percent greater than the value time. And uh, so measuring things like that can be very, very helpful. But to answer your, your question, I think it's listening to the customer, listening to the staff that provide services, uh, having high trust multidisciplinary teams that are fluent with the application of uh, proven improvement methods. And these include being absolutely clear what the objective is, taking baseline measurements, tracking those uh, and looking at the delta between objective and um, actual performance. Um, and then testing and adjusting as we as we go. In short, uh, adopting um, plan, do, study, act cycles. Uh, and that's one method. To, and using a range of statistical tools and techniques that can help us understand um, that um, the difference between change and improvement. Uh, um, uh, all improvement is change, but not all change is improvement. And so statistical process control uh, uh, is a, a, a very valuable method of us being able to discern when something changes, is that the result of normal variation in any process? Going back to Deming's work um, um, some considerably time ago, um, or, um, uh, or, or have we made some special cause variation by making an intervention that really improves what we're doing? Um, so making sure we've got empowered teams, having the right governance structure in place um, so that teams feel supported. Um, uh, and if there are roadblocks that need to be um, um, pushed out of the way, then appropriately they're pushed out of the way unless uh, unless they're performing a valuable function and making sure that teams are properly resourced. And in the, in the middle of, of, of all the pressures, not just COVID, but all the other pressures that, uh, that within the MOD and frankly, every other organization I've worked in face, that's always difficult because uh, time and energy uh, for the urgent will always be taken from the important. And, and transformational change is always important um, sometimes it's both urgent and important. And during COVID, it has been, which is why most healthcare uh, systems across the world, including our own within the NHS and in the F Defence Medical Services, transformed outpatient consultation within a handful of weeks, where many people, including me, have been trying to do that for 20 or 30 years. But there became an irresistible requirement to change. And the final thing I, I would offer is one of the challenges we face within the MOD is the short uh, cycle times of officers on particular assignments, two to three years. Uh, frankly, I'm just not used to that. Uh, I'm used to people being in post for major changes, like, for example, uh, building a new hospital, um, uh, commissioning a new hospital, or a major change of service redesign. Um, I'm used to uh, senior people being available for, uh, if not the duration of the project, uh, but certainly a large part of the bean to cup of the project. It's really interesting what you say there in terms of the, the, the life cycle of a project versus the appointment cycle that the MOD runs to and the, and the churn that goes through. And it's a, it's a conversation which I know is being held quite regularly at the moment on, on, mil, on military Twitter reference other programmes. Um, and it's certainly one of those, uh, one of those infernal questions of arithmetic that you have to go through. But it is interesting what you're talking about, the requirement versus improvement, improving what you're already doing to get the best out of that system, and then the changes in requirement that are always going on. Um, and I think one of the questions that we would really like to, to dive into, if you've got time, is integrated operating concept, the integrated review came out with these different um, versions of what defence was going to look like. You're already changing and to, to meet a transformational change uh, programme. How are you now adjusting to meet the outcomes of the IR and the, and the IOPC? Yes, thanks, uh, Andy. Um, as you would imagine, we are very pleased to contribute to um, the thinking uh, from our point of view to the, uh, the IR. Uh, and we are absolutely aligned, as you'd expect, to uh, ensure 
that we support the integrated operating concept. And there are a range of implications for us, uh, as you imply, uh, and that includes um, that we need to uh, provide at, um, uh, at reach expertise, so close to the, uh, the front line or actually at the front line, um, both reach forward and reach back, um, so that um, those at the front line have access to world-class advice and input, uh, albeit that that may be provided from the firm base or from allies. And there's some fantastic um, technology which uh, is now in use, Proximy, uh, which enables um, uh, those caring for, uh, for casualties um, at the front line to, uh, to reach back to the firm base and get uh, global expertise um, to help support surgical intervention and other interventions, of course, medical interventions as well. So being able to use technology and, 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 and human skill and intelligence in a way that uh, provides the very best care to those that serve our nation um, in, uh, in often very austere environments is really important. The cold chain is really important. So blood and blood uh, products um, can be provided as close to the front line as, as possible. Uh, and uh, us being able to move very quickly so, and having um, smaller teams uh, able to move with some considerable agility, but also with the ability to, to, to cohere and coalesce when we need a larger center of expertise. Um, and it's, it's often speculated, as, as you and colleagues will be aware, uh, that the, the model of Camp Bastion served us extremely well with world-class outcomes, which have indeed taught the NHS uh, and our organisation when I was achieving second knotting, we were beneficiaries of that. But that, that sort of model is, is much less likely to be required in the, in the future, as far as we anticipate. Um, it, there'll be much sure, more agile, smaller cells uh, of, of, of uh, clinicians that can then have access to um, um, the degree of uh, expertise required and then the repatriation of casualty um, as and when um, um, necessary. So that's a really important aspect. The application is, is, is implied in my response of digital technology and making sure that uh, it is reliable wherever we are operating and also that we've got methods of working um, as and when that technology isn't available. Um, and that's a really important um, aspect of what we're doing. But we're developing Cortisone, which is far more than the replacement of our existing medical information system, DMACP. And Cortisone will provide um, a step change, a night's move, if you will, in terms of the support that we provide clinicians uh, and indeed um, uh, patients. And we're in the process of laying down what we've described as the digital backbone um, uh, and uh, over the next uh, uh, few years, um, we will be um, uh, implementing a series of modules uh, that will provide a radically transformed and superior service to that's possible from our existing system. And that includes some really great um, uh, interconnections and interoperability with um, uh, the, the four devolved nations, uh, which means that we can uh, both send and receive um, diagnostic tests including CT, MRI and other, other tests um, with um, um, the devolved administration as far as NHS is concerned, as well as other health care providers around the world. So digital technology is going to be a really important part of that. And, and there's a very substantial investment um, in uh, DMS and wider uh, MOD, as you'll be aware, to equip us uh, as necessary to, uh, to, to be at the forefront of that. That's really interesting how the the, the distance between the rear areas, the the, um, the, the at-home capabilities um, within defence hospital units and clinicians back home in the UK and the forward basing is being um, is, is really being narrowed, that, that distance between the two. Of course, that, that's absolutely, and I, and I think you touched on it when you, when you talk about repatriation, that's absolutely vital when you're um, in the actual operating theatre, when you're doing the surgery, to have that expertise sat on your shoulder telling you what, what you actually, as somebody who may be very experienced but not quite specialist in that specific area, how to, how, how to undertake that operation. One of the things I think COVID has thrown up is this idea of domestic resilience in your um, uh, in your in your home areas, what work is being is being done to really bolster that that home resilience? Bearing in mind what we've just gone through over the last uh, eighteen months and the potential into the future, is there is there work being taken undertaken there? Yeah, thank you, Adam. And I, I can only speak authoritatively within defence medical services, though the same exercise is going across MOD and, and wider government. Um, within defence medical services, we have already um, undertaken the lessons learned exercise. 
and we're in the process of codifying um, that. Uh, and that, that's taught us a number of um, valuable lessons in terms of uh, making sure that um, we have um, uh, appropriate supplies, not only of PPE, but a whole range of other um, items, uh, some of which um, uh, we struggled with, to be frank, at certain episodes, as did much of the, uh, much of the, uh, the global health um, world. Um, so we've, 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 uh, we've got a better appreciation of the sort of uh, um, items um, that we need to have um, appropriate buffer stocks for. And that's not in any way saying that the next major challenge is going to be an identical COVID, but we've learned a lot through this, uh, through this exercise, not just about COVID, but how we respond more generally. Uh, information systems, um, communicating with, um, with our um, uh, um, uh, dedicated uh, teams across the, um, the world to make sure that we provide up-to-date information has been really um, important. And the contribution between ourselves, MOD and wider government. Because um, I think we've learned a lot about how to uh, to work as as a, a as a a community, all focused on doing um, the very best we can to serve the nation, and respect and understand the different strengths that we bring, uh, including the formidable um, um, abilities in terms of logistics that the the military provide, uh, and the the and the ability to um, um, to uh, operates in a very high tempo environment in terms of the chain of command. Uh, and, and that's something I know uh, NHS colleagues have, uh, have valued and learned from enormously. So we've, we've, we've conducted a stock take, if you will, uh, Andy, we've uh, codified the, uh, the key lessons uh, and uh, um, uh, we, we look forward to sharing those um, with other colleagues so that we can enrich what we do for, uh, so we are even better prepared. And that the, 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 the foundation of all this, of course, um, are our people. Uh, and the exceptional expertise, the exceptional dedication uh, that um, our people within Defence Medical Service and wider MOD and indeed uh, within the NHS have brought in a selfless way to dedicate themselves in the face of some considerable danger on many occasions um, is, uh, is inspiring. And without that, we can have the best equipment in the world, but it would be useless. I think it's one of the... It's- And it really speaks to my final question for you and and the key points in all of this, which is the lived experience and your people. Um, And from what I understand, part of your agenda from the very start of coming into this role was to make DMS the best place to work within defence. How are you seeking to square the the sort of the recruitment retention development circle for defence medical personnel, given that they are in such high demand that they are constantly on the front line there's no there's no rear actual on job for for defense medical you're either clinical doing the job at, on the front line or you're clinical doing the job back back home in the nhs um or, or in one of the headquarters how do you how do you deheat that pot and really make it so that is the best place for them to work yeah thank you um and the, the context as your question implies is a global shortage of clinicians we can't recruit our way out of um, the challenge because every uh, every health system in the world is um, uh, is desperately short of clinicians. Uh, and the the government established five new medical schools uh, some years ago, uh, three or four years ago, with the intention over time of of being able to train uh, more clinicians. But that that takes time, clearly. So to answer your your question, in terms of reconciling the um, the, the challenge of demand and development and retention recruitment. Uh, and um, what we're seeking to do, and this is a process, not an event. As my mentor said, uh, who was Norwegian, uh, my academic mentor, uh, when I was doing my doctorate, he said, um, the stars should be used as um, navigation, if not as a destination. I, we've set ourselves a bold ambition. And as far as I'm concerned and we're concerned, uh, we are going after making the DMS the best place in the MOD to work. And that will take some considerable time. And one of the key things that we can do to better understand how we accomplish that is to listen to our people, to listen to their lived experience, which we do through a variety of ways, all of them imperfect. Surveys, conversations, informal coffee rooms, virtual, physical, actually getting out and about um, as uh, as a leadership team, listening to NCOs, listening to uh, uh, the most junior ranks in terms of experience, in order to understand what can we better do to serve them to do the really important work that they do. And that is embodied um, in um, the Defence Medical Services People Plan, 
uh, which is a bold mandate and manifesto of us uh, over time breathing oxygen into the ambition of us being the best place to work in the MOD. And that means that we give careful thought um, and on a, a, a single team basis, military, civilian, and indeed contractors, um, understanding individuals' interests, uh, their career aspirations, um, the reconciliation between aspiration and opportunity, us seeing what training we can provide both in DMS and, as I said earlier, outside of the DMS. We've established uh, through some fantastic um, uh, leadership uh, by uh, Brigadier uh, Toby Rowland uh, within the Defence Medical Academy for the first time um, the Defence Leadership, so the, the Medical um, Leadership um, um, Academy and Programme. And we, um, our first cohort had 25 places. We had 250 applicants, recognising the appetite of very many to become uh, even more skillful leaders. One of my favourite definitions of leadership development is learning to be oneself more skillfully. If we equip our people to feel confident, they will increasingly provide an environment within which they will enable people to grow in a consistent way. Um, and they themselves will feel nourished and supported during the, the complete arc of their, um, uh, their career with us. Uh, and so our people plan is really important, having succession planning, high quality appraisals um, for civilian as well as military, and understanding um, the, the sort of opportunities that lie ahead of an individual and us doing our best to best equip them to compete for those roles uh, or to be appointed to them in whatever system is appropriate, depending if they're military or, or civilian. Uh, and, and essentially... Um, us um, um, uh, acting in accordance with our, um, our words because it's, it's by our, our deeds shall be known not by our words and, and I hope over time it will be abundantly clear that we uh, put enormous um, energy and resource and value into uh, our people but this is to say Andy this is a process not an event and it's at the same time as enormous pressure on our people as with others within MOD and uh, wider government to deliver some very, very demanding uh, and challenging outputs. Uh, but if uh, um, I regard investment in our, in our people as an investment, not as a cost, and the dividend comes uh, through uh, um, in that staff feel better valued, better supported, we have better retention rates, we are able to attract talent, and we are able to grow the, the extraordinary talent that's entrusted to us in a way that gives our patients and the single services the very best value that we can. Thank you. I think that's a, a fairly comprehensive uh, run overview of the of, of of what I understand to be really the the signature piece at the moment for defence medical services, which is unified career management and how that is going to be rolled out. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious of, of, of time at the moment. One final question to yourself: Since coming into the assignment, into the into, into the post. What would you say has been your, your biggest takeaway thus far from, from the job? And what would you like to be your, your defining moment going forward? What, what, would be, what would success look like to you? The, um, the, the takeaway experience that I have, uh, Andy, and there are many, so it's a challenge to, to pick one, um, is um, dedication of the people. And... Inevitably, COVID has amplified that, uh, that, that resident capability, military and civilian. Uh, but the extraordinary efforts and the sheer imagination, inventiveness that have been applied to, uh, to solve some exquisite COVID challenges are just um, um, off the scale impressive. And to, to, have to play a, a part in helping deliver that and working alongside such people is is a huge privilege uh, for me and and i see my task is to bring whatever experience i can to to create an even more effective um, um, organization to provide the uh, the optimal level of support for uh, for, our, for our people and in terms of the um, the, the the signature um achievement uh, i would want um um the uh, uh, the ambition of, of our people plan, i.e. making the DMS the best place in the MOD, for the delta to be unequivocal. When we look at our baseline measurements, that it's clear that we've got momentum, that we won't have achieved it within, um, uh, with, uh, within a few number of years, but we will over time. But to get a real sense that the lived experience of our people has, uh, has palpably further improved. 
Well, thank you very much. I think that's that's been a very comprehensive run through of the the, the challenges that, that really DMS face and what you're doing to orientate towards them. Um, I think it's Richard Harding, he said, when you, when you look at an organisation, you've got to look at its visions for success, the structures and the lived experience. And I think um, all of that has come through in, in today's conversation. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Hamer, Director General, Defence Medical Services. Thank you. Thank you, Eddie. A Call to Arms is part of the Military Sciences Profession of Arms programme. The show is produced by Pepe Van Arnen and Chris Jones and is sponsored by Airbus. If you enjoyed the show, please rate it and leave a review. Your feedback helps us tailor future interviews to what you, our audience, want to know. RUSI is a membership organisation and it is thanks to our members and sponsors that we are able to maintain our independence, challenge orthodoxy and deliver groundbreaking thought leadership. If you consider yourself to be connected to the profession of arms, then perhaps membership is for you. You can find more information at rusi.org forward slash membership. For less than the price of a good cocktail each month, you can join a growing global community with exclusive access to events, research and insights that put you ahead of your peers. Thank you for tuning in. and I look forward to welcoming you back next month for more from A Call to Arms. <laughs>